Hello. If you are Catholic, you probably know about an apocryphal story that has been circulating for years now on the internet, which deals with Napoleon Bonaparte, the great French general and emperor, who um, was excommunicated uh, by uh, the Pope at the time. And so the story goes, when he was excommunicated, he stormed into the uh, apartments of the Archbishop of Paris and said in a rage that uh, he would destroy the church within a month. The archbishop is said to have replied, Your Excellency, if the bishops and the priests have not been able to destroy the church in 1800 years, I do not think you'll be able to do so in a month. It's a nice story. It almost certainly never happened. But it does reference one very clear historical act, clear historical, true historical act, which was that the Pope at the time, Pius VII, did actually excommunicate, excommunicate Napoleon Bonaparte. And that Pope, Pius VII, is the subject of this week's episode of Catholic Lives. Pius VII was born Barnaba Chiaramonti in 1742 in Cesena, Italy, to a distinguished aristocratic family. He entered a Benedictine monastery at the age of 16, and later on would become a professor at Rome and Parma in the colleges of his order. He would become influenced in uh, the late 18th century by the atmosphere of Italian Jansenism uh, while he was a professor. If you don't know what Jansenism is, this is a 17th century <clears throat> um, sort of heretical um, growth within uh, the Catholic world, which tended to be really austere about the sacraments, tended to be too austere about the sacraments, actually. It's one of the reasons it was condemned. It was, for the most part, not really heretical in any major way in late 18th century Italy, but it was also this Jansenist strain in Italian Catholicism was receptive to the modern sciences. And so Pius is a very learned uh, man who was conversant with the intellectual currents of his day, um, and he was, for the most part, very popular as a professor. He did face some opposition within his order. Uh, complaints were lodged against him, but they were dismissed by the Pope Pius VI at the time, who promoted him first to be a bishop and then to be a cardinal. When the French Revolution broke out in 1789, the church gradually came to a sort of uh, loggerheads with it as the revolution became more radical. Eventually, under the French government called the Directorate in the 1790s, the French went on the offensive and began conquering parts of Europe. And in 1796, this is what happened in Italy. <clears throat> when the French, future French leader Napoleon went into northern Italy and conquered large parts of it. And Caramonti, as bishop uh, in northern Italy, was instrumental in preserving the peace with the invading, Fr uh, invading French, while at the same time forbidding his flock to take the oath to the constitution of the Italian Satellite Republic set up by Napoleon. And this is one of the things he was noted for, um, Chiara de Monti as a, as a bishop and later on cardinal and pope, uh, being someone who was able to sort of ride the line between having to accommodate with this revolutionary force, the post-revolutionary world in Europe, while still maintaining the principles of the church, during a Christmas homily, for example, in 1797, a famous one that he gave, Chiaramonti advocated submission to the New Republic. He, he urged his flock to embrace it, saying that democracy was not, in fact, antithetical to the constitution of the church, but while also emphasizing that natural virtues were not sufficient uh, to sustain that form of government, you know, and that it could not last in the long run without the influence of religion, without the influence of the church. When Pius VI died in 1798, uh, conclave was called for 1799, and in March of 1800, Bonaba Chiaramonti is actually elected as Pope and becomes Pius VII. And the <clears throat> years of his uh, pontificate, 1800-1823, the first 14 years are mostly taken up with his uh, having to deal with Napoleon's France. Napoleon becomes sole ruler, basically, of, um, of France in 1799. And the situation of the church in 1800 
in France is a very anomalous one. It has not had any sort of legal position since its essential abolition during the revol the um, during the uh, the uh, most radical part phases of the uh, of the French Revolution. And so uh, Napoleon wanted to bring the church back and sort of make peace at home with the church as much as he could. And so Pius entered into negotiations with Napoleon, and they wound up signing a concordat in 1801, which gave church legal recognition again uh, uh, within France. Not the same recognition it had before <clears throat> um, the uh, before the revolution hit. It was not the same relationship. Um, the church had had much of its property seized. The Pope didn't bother to try to regain it. They probably wouldn't have got it anyway if they had. But he did manage to get the state to provide a salary for priests and bishops. <clears throat> uh, at the same time, the Concordat recognized the church as the religion of the majority of the French people. So it gave it a status as the sort of, you know, religion of the majority of the Frenchmen. But this was a difference. This was a big difference from what it had been in the so-called Ancien Regime, the uh, absolute monarchy before the revolution, which uh, its legal status was as the religion of the state. That was the way the law read. So that did not go back to, the, to that with this concordat. <clears throat> Nor was the Pope able to gain submission to his authority. Um, those bishops who were called constitutional bishops in France at the time. What that refers to is in 1790, the um, French revolutionary government came up with a scheme essentially to nationalize the church called the civil constitution of the clergy and required a year later all the bishops to take, take an oath, swear, swear an oath of allegiance to this new constitution, which, by the way, would have done things like, for example, make the priesthood open to local election. You would have elected, parishes would elect their priests, bishops as well. At a diocesan level, the Pope condemned it, and it split the church badly in, <clears throat> uh, in France at the time. Uh, kind of an uh, analogous, by the way, if you know what's going on in China right now, to the state-supported church of the French and the, the underground church there in, uh, in China. Uh, he didn't get many of them to submit. He basically one uh, came back into the fold for the Pope. And Pius tried to gain more concessions from Napoleon, but was largely unsuccessful. Uh, he did, however, um, besides, you know, gaining recognition again, did make a very big impression on the people of France because he not only visited uh, France for these negotiations, he visited and agreed to come to Napoleon's coronation. If you don't know the story of Napoleon's crowning of himself <clears throat> as emperor in 1804, uh, he did this. Uh, he basically crowned himself. He told the Pope he was going to crown himself. Pius wasn't necessarily all that thrilled about this, but he went along. He wanted to have amity and comity with uh, the French nation. But uh, over the next several years, uh, relations with Napoleon between Napoleon and the papacy deteriorated, uh, mainly over a couple of couple of issues. One was the the um, liberties of the church were coming under uh, you, know, you see attack by the French state. It's a long story. The state, uh, Napoleon went back on some of his promises to a certain degree, began trying to extend state control over certain aspects of the church, more or less. Uh, but mostly they deteriorated because of Napoleon's insistence that Pius actively support his continental system. If you know what the continental system was, <clears throat> Napoleon was the master of most of Europe uh, by 1804, 1805, and 1806. His only major enemy at, at a certain point was basically um, the kingdom of the United Kingdom, Great Britain. And so he tried to get all of Europe essentially to sort of boycott um, British goods. He banned the importation of British goods into Europe. And he wanted Pius to go along with this. He wanted Pius basically to become his open political partner, which he refused to do. Pius wanted to keep the papal states neutral. Uh, and preserve the church's independence at all costs. His main concern was with the church as a, uh, in its spiritual function, basically, its religious function. The final straw came in 1808, when Napoleon invaded Rome and uh, took the uh, city of Rome, and then in 1809, annexed the Papal States. And this is when, in response, uh, Pius had the entire city of Rome placarded with uh, a bull of excommunication, excommunicating the instigators of the 
uh, of the uh, of the invasion, not by name, but it clearly included Napoleon. Napoleon certainly took that took it that way, and so uh, he sent troops. He had his subordinates in Italy send troops and take the Pope prisoner, and he was imprisoned first in Italy uh, for the next uh, three years, and in 1812 he was brought back to France to Fontainebleau outside of uh, outside of Paris. And this was actually one of the one of the great man's one of Napoleon's uh, blunders in the latter half of his his rule, uh, along with invading Russia and the continental system, trying to attack Britain. It didn't work, by the way, economically speaking. But this taking the Pope prisoner and seeing the Pope, you know, carried off in chains to to Versailles, deeply offended Catholic Europe, uh, particularly in Spain. Of course, if you don't know, from 1808 onwards. There was a, a guerrilla war being fought by Spanish guerrillas against Napoleon's rule there. This just inflamed that, gave it an extra cause. It was a really stupid thing to do. And Pius, in his own way, contributed to his downfall after he was defeated in 1814. Uh, first at the Battle of the Nations, then later on at Waterloo. Um, Pius uh, had his uh, Secretary of State, Eric Holcom Salvi, um, go to the Congress of Vienna, where the great powers emerged after the Paul Napoleon to sort of redraw, you know, Europe after this 30-year conflagration of revolutionary, you know, fighting. Uh, and he got them, managed to regain the papal states for the papacy at the Congress of Vienna, more or less intact as to what they had been before the, um, before the revolutions, before they'd been pushed out by Napoleon. And then finally he returned to Rome, did Pius, in 1814, triumphantly after several years in exile. <clears throat> Much of his pontificate, uh, as that foregoing um, indicates, and even from the latter half of the, his reign from 1814 to 1823, uh, he had to deal with the fallout of the French Revolution. Um, he had uh, several of the concordats that were signed with revolutionary governments in France and Italy and elsewhere, to give one example, allowed for the state to recognize divorce, which, of course, the Pope did not want. I think mean, it was impossible part of the revolution, but Pius, in those circumstances, pretty much couldn't do a whole lot about it. And so he was having to negotiate these concordats in sometimes not very favorable circumstances. Uh, he also had to renegotiate the church's position with several different countries in the latter half of his pontificate, particularly in Germany. Uh, if you don't know, uh, I'm using the term Germany as a geographical designation. Prior to 1870, uh, there was no single country in Germany. It was a, a mix, mishmash of different kingdoms. But um, Napoleon's conquest had conquered um, um, the states of Germany and reorganized them into a smaller confederation of states, which inflamed, and the French Revolution did this wherever it went, inflamed people's ideas of nationalism. It inspired people to want to unite Germany into one country. And so Pius had to sort of carefully renegotiate, um, essentially concordats with multiple countries in the latter part of his, his reign. Furthermore, he had to reorganize the Papal States after the war, which met with opposition, uh, both from some of his own bishops, some of his own cardinals in the Curia who wanted to return to a pre-revolutionary order in the Papal States. And what I mean by that is uh, some of the revolutionary changes were never done away with. Uh, the biggest one, to my mind, is that uh, nobility in the Papal States had had, had feudal privileges like they had in France. Um, and they were abolished, as they had been in France. They were never brought back, those sorts of things. On the other hand, you had radicals uh, who were intent on further change. Uh, a bunch of secret societies sprang up within the Papal States, but also elsewhere throughout, throughout Italy, um, including the so-called Carbonari, uh, who sprang up specifically in the, in, the, in the Papal States, wanted to have a Roman Republic, Tried to, would try later on to revive the Roman Republic, uh, whose principles Pius condemned. And so... Yeah, it led to sort of new challenges that the papacy had to sort of deal with and grapple with uh, in terms of maintaining its independence vis-a-vis -vis all these different players as a result of this changed world in which uh, Pius um, lived through. Moreover, he did make several changes to the church itself, uh, internal matters. Uh, most famously, in several countries before 1814, he reestablished the Society of Jesus, which had been destroyed in the 1770s uh, at the insistence of the French king. Uh, but in 1814, he restored the Society of Jesus as for the universal church. And so it's been with us ever since, for good and for ill. <laughs> I'm sure if you've listened to this, you probably know what I mean, but uh, he is the one who did this. 
So after a 30 year, 40 year period brought back the Jesuits. Um, he also began the process of reconciling with the newly independent states in South America, because if you don't know, in 1819 and 1820, um, uh, former colonies began to break away from Spain and then later on uh, Portugal in the, in the 19th century. And at first, Pius was skeptical of this. He was, again, like most popes in the 19th century, he had a de facto sort of aristocratic regard for monarchy. But he got most of his information about these these uh, these revolutions from the Spanish monarchy, and once he began to get better information toward the end of his reign, he decided to send a delegation um, to treat with these revolutionary governments at the end of his pontificate. Uh, he never lived to see the fruition to come to fruition, but he is the one who instigated this reconciliation. Uh, and furthermore, he also erected during his uh, pontificate several new dioceses in the United States as it was becoming, uh, growing faster and faster, dioceses like the Diocese of Boston, New York, Charleston, and elsewhere, were his creation during his, during his lifetime. So a builder of new structures in the church, in addition to all this. And then finally, the man himself, uh, Caramonte, was a, Caramonte, I should say, was a cultured man in many respects. He encouraged the arts. Who, uh, reorg who actually revived uh, some of the colleges, the, the, the English and the Scottish colleges in Rome had been done away with. He brought them back. These are co colleges, seminary colleges, basically, in Rome for people from those countries. Uh, he donated um, uh, large numbers of books to the Vatican Library and so increased its uh, holdings. And, uh, in fact, during his pontificate, Rome became a favorite spot for artists, particularly the, the uh, school of painters called the Nazarene School, who were reacting against, if you know what neoclassicism is, in the 18th century, the sort of very, you know, stately, sort of, you know, rationalistic, not rationalistic, but, uh, um, you know, drawing on classical models. And um, they wanted to revive a more spiritually engaged Christian form of art. Uh, they painted religious scenes from the Bible with more, you know, emotion. This is the time of Romanticism in Western Europe, generally speaking, so this is part of the deal here as well. And even um, someone who is not definitely a uh, part of that movement, someone named Jacques-Louis David, if you know who this is, Jacques-Louis David was the um, great artist of the French Revolution. He painted most of the revolutionaries during the 1790s. Uh, became a painter uh, during for Napoleon during his reign. When uh, Pius came uh, to um, to France in 1804 for Napoleon's coronation, David was impressed by Pius's simplicity and Christian humility and painted a famous portrait of him in 1805, which you can find easily on the internet. You should look at it. Uh, it depicts him in a fairly, you know, a fairly simple style reflecting his view of this this Christian leader. And if you look at, by the way, at the bottom half of that painting, Pius has a little paper in his hand, which says in, says in Latin, Pius VII, patron of the arts. So he is definitely a cultured uh, person as well as being a good statesman for the church during his lifetime. Uh, and finally, his piety and humility, uh, which were apparent to people, his contemporaries, uh, also included a forgiving nature. Uh, Pius VII welcomed many of the relatives, daughter, for example, of Napoleon Bonaparte to, to Rome, to his court, after Napoleon was sent into exile in St. Helena in the uh, Atlantic Ocean by the British. And in fact, Pius VII actually interceded on Napoleon's behalf to the British when he heard of the conditions of his captivity on St. Helena. They weren't apparently very good. Uh, and when Finally, when Napoleon requested a priest attend him in his captivity, Pius actually sent a French abbe to the island as a chaplain just for him. So a forgiving, cultured man, a courageous man, someone whose life is worthy of being remembered. Uh, unfortunately, in 1823, in July of 1823, he fell in his apartment, fractured his thigh, took to his bed, never to rise again, died on August 20th, 1823, and thus ended the life of the Pope who excommunicated Napoleon, who I believe at this late date is still, I think he may be a servant of God, uh, but he's not even barely begun on the road to uh, uh, to sainthood. Maybe you should pray for it. Maybe that will uh, come to fruition someday. But uh, lesser known of the great uh, pontiffs of history. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, episode of Catholic Lives. If you if you did, please go to, uh, um, to Apple Podcasts, like, subscribe, leave comments. 
Um, try to get, get the word out about our podcast. Um, please uh, visit our Facebook page and get more information on the talks I give in Kansas City, Missouri, where I'm based out of, and you can get um, information on what I'm up to, what I'll be talking about next year, and um, uh, other info. So thank you guys again. Uh, have a great uh, have a great week. Uh, take care and God bless.